so tonight I'll be talking to you about my honours project uh, from back in 2019, uh, which was supported by the Oatleaf Flora and Fauna Conservation Society. Um, so I thought I'd start with a brief introduction as to who I am and what I do. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an obsessive birder um, and an ecologist, and I've been keen on birds and more broadly the natural world since, yeah, as long as I can remember. I grew up in Glebe uh, and still live here today, uh, but much of my childhood was spent exploring the mid-north coast around Hawks Nest and Wild Lakes National Park, uh, which undoubtedly grew my interest. I spent many hours volunteering on a number of conservation research trips, working on threatened species such as regent honey eaters, swift parrots, Gould's petrel and others. Um, and I've also been lucky enough to travel around Australia and more recently internationally, uh, but not, not too recently, um, chasing birds and other critters. Um, when I finished school, I thought I'd try and make a career out of um, my strong interest in birds. Um, so I studied ecology at UNSW from 2016 to 2018. And then in 2019, I completed my honours uh, year, uh, which I'll be talking about tonight. Currently, I'm a research assistant at UNSW in the Centre for Ecosystem Science, which is directed by Professor Richard Kingsford. Um, and I work on a range of projects um, from probably my strongest passion at the moment, which is seabirds, um, to species recovery after the black summer bushfires and water policy and management. So my honours year uh, in 2019 was spent researching arid birds in Sturt National Park, roughly a thousand kilometres northwest of Sydney in the far eastern Streslaki Desert, and about as far away from seabirds as you can get. Sturt sits uh, in the far northwest of New South Wales, and I conducted my research um, in the far western side of Sturt National Park. Um, within the area now managed by UNSW under the Wild Deserts Project, um, as well as working on pastoral land over the border in South Australia. The Wild Deserts Project uh, is a large scale mammal reintroduction program managed by UNSW Sydney, collaborating with uh, DPI, uh, Taronga and Ecological Horizons. Broadly, the project involves reintroducing uh, seven locally extinct native mammals back into the park within a total of uh, 40 kilometres of predator and grazer exclusion fences. My project actually had very little to do with the fences, um, though it's provided some baseline and drought time data on bird communities for future comparisons. However, working in this area provided me not only with a great research opportunity um, and just a great opportunity in general to see the place out there, um, but also to be co-supervised by Drs. Reese Pedler and Rebecca West, who are pictured um, down in the bottom right there, uh, who live out there and manage the project on the ground, while also raising a, a young family and working with pesky students like me. So while I was out there, I conducted two separate studies, uh, which I'll discuss tonight. The first and most substantial study uh, which formed my honours thesis was a comparison of bird community abundance and composition, as well as habitat use either side of the dingo barrier fence, which separates Sturt National Park from neighbouring pastoral land in South Australia. I'll explain the rationale behind this comparison uh, next. The second, was the, the second uh, study that I did was a comparatively minor study which involved um, morning, midday and evening surveys of drinking birds at a small water point at Fort Grey, um, out in Sturt, which opportunistically, um, those surveys were punctuated by a small amount of rainfall, which let me uh, essentially compare before and after rainfall to look at how birds use permanent and ephemeral water in the landscape during drought. So, any research conducted um, over a short period of time, like an honours project, which is all from start to finish, it's, it's eight months. Um, it's, any project like that is best informed by an understanding of broader and long-term influences on the, that particular study system that um, you're working in. 
So for my study area, um, the likely um, broad scale influences on bird communities were rainfall or lack thereof during drought and land management, including the influence of dingoes on the landscape. The broad effects of rainfall on the landscape are straightforward as rainfall promotes productivity or plant growth um, in arid systems. So during drought, you'd expect to find far fewer birds, for example, when resources are less abundant due to limited water availability. This drought was particularly severe. Um, and in the area I was working in, uh, only 94 millimetres of rain fell over the two years leading up to and including my study, uh, which represented the driest two year period on record uh, for that area. So next, um, in terms of land management, in my study area, the dingo barrier fence, um, supported also by baiting and shooting regimes in New South Wales, has effectively rendered the dingo functionally extinct on the New South Wales side of the fence. By contrast, the dingo uh, isn't killed or controlled at the landscape scale in South Australia. So this has resulted in a significant landscape level change over the 130 odd years since the dingo barrier fence was built. In brief summary, dingoes in this region exert what's called top-down control um, on large grazing mammals such as kangaroos and also feral cats and foxes, primarily through predation. Kangaroos graze particularly on grass, so with less grazing when there's less kangaroos, there's more grass where dingoes are present um, and controlling these kangaroos. Similarly, cats and foxes prey on small mammals such as the dusky hopping mouse. Um, so these hopping mice eat seeds um, of shrubs and trees. So with less cats and foxes where dingoes are present, there's less shrubs and trees due to greater abundances of these hopping mice. Effectively within New South Wales, uh, there's more trees and shrubs and less grass than in South Australia, which for birds represents uh, significantly different habitat types. So it can be expected that bird communities differ in response to these habitat differences uh, either side of the fence. So research actually investigating the effects of the dingo barrier fence on bird life is fairly limited in my study region. Um, and all of them, all of those studies were completed during periods of relative resource abundance, either during or after substantial rainfall. And you can see them, the three studies um, that have been done on this um, are all in that wet period that I've marked on the figure. Um, so these studies all indicated that ground birds, which are susceptible to predation by cats and foxes, uh, barn owls, which uh, prey on rodents, which are more abundant on the South Australian side of the fence, and granivores, which feed on grass seeds. Um, and grass is much, um, grass seeds are much more numerous in the South Australian side, um, were more abundant where dingoes were present. Uh, in this figure, I've mapped uh, annual and monthly rainfall from 2000 to 2020. Um, and you can see the periods of three prior studies uh, compared to mine. As such, I, I investigated how this observed pattern in bird communities may change during drought uh, when resources were considerably more scarce than during these previous studies. So with that background, I had two primary uh, questions or aims. Firstly, does top-down pressure from dingoes on the landscape uh, still affect bird communities during drought? And I predicted that this would be the case um, and that I would see differences in the bird community either side of the dingo barrier fence, even during drought. Secondly, I wanted to know how birds interact with their habitat in this area during drought. And so for this, I, predict, I predicted that bird habitat interactions would be largely driven by foraging. So that is that there'd be a logical link that could be drawn between the habitats I found birds in and their diets. So to test this, um, I surveyed birds along two kilometer transects on the crests of dunes each paired with two kilometer transects um, through an adjacent swale. Um, so 
yeah, a swale is basically the, the low part that sits between dunes. Um, so yeah, in, I've included an image here um, from a drone where you can see the distinct differences between the habitat types. So you've got the dune on the right-hand side uh, with a large amount of vegetation, well, more vegetation on it. Um, and then you've got the swale here on the left and you can see it's considerably more sparse. So in total, there were four of these paired transects either side of the dingo barrier fence. Conditions were that dry that I was able to walk the full four kilometers of a single pair of transects, uh, plus all the distance in between to get there and get back to the car. Um, and I could only see two individual birds, um, though on average, I saw about eight per transect. So that's, that's, that's low densities of birds. Um, so with that in mind, I decided that I'd mark the location of every bird that I saw on my GPS and also with flagging tape, uh, which still took a lot of work, but was easier than it may sound given how few birds were around. Uh, I sampled each transect twice and then returned to the GPS points to complete vegetation transects around them. Uh, identifying, identifying and measuring um, the height and width of all the plants in a 25 and 400 meter squared area um, centered on those points. So this provided me with measurements of fine and then also broader scale habitat variables to then link to bird presence. After all the bird surveys were done, um, I worked out the four most common species and measured how much time the uh, individuals of those species uh, spent in different habitat types and where in the habitat they spent time. So for example, I found red cap robins were one of the more common species. So I went out, found an individual red cap robin and then worked out how much time it spent in a tree compared to say a small shrub or in the open. So I wanted to, um, at this point, to specifically acknowledge uh, Owen Lishman and Max Breckenridge, who came out and volunteered um, collectively two and a half months of time out at Sturt, helping me do all of this field work. So what did I find? So to look at the differences across the dingo fence, I used a statistical method which allowed me to compare bird communities either side of the fence using bird abundances. So in answer to the first question, I found no statistical difference in avian communities at a species level, um, but also at a dietary group level um, across the dingo barrier fence during my study period in drought, contrary to the prior findings in wetter periods. So the dietary group community abundance was derived simply by getting all the individual species and then putting them into uh, grouping their abundances in a, a broader group which represented their diet. So for example, red cap robins are insectivorous and so are white-winged fairy wrens. So those two went into the overall abundance measurement for insectivores. Um, yeah, so this, this effectively suggests that the importance of rainfall or the lack of rainfall um, increased um, it, its influence on this community during drought. Um, so alternatively, um, low observed numbers of birds may have made a difference across the fence, um, if present, uh, quite difficult to detect. Um, however, extremely reduced bird numbers leading to no detectable difference across the fence would still suggest that there's an increase in the strength of the effects of um, resource limitation associated with drought on this community because you just have so few birds that there is no difference across the fence. In answer to my second question, uh, insectivores, particularly black-faced wood swallows, red cap robins, white-winged and purple-backed fairy wrens, and also white-backed swallows, uh, were the most abundant dietary group of birds on the surveys uh, by a long way. So I used three different statistical methods um, and the agreement between them all 
to essentially rank the importance of different habitat features at the two scales of vegetation quadrats for each group of birds. So in this figure, um, important habitat features are ranked from top to bottom for insectivorous bird presence and the bars expanding, extending to the left of the center line uh, indicate a variable which uh, negatively influences insectivore presence. So where there was uh, more, uh, yeah, looking at the top uh, variable there, you've got total richness at 400 meters squared. So that is the total number of different tree species at, or tree and shrub species at, um, the 400 meter squared um, vegetation quadrat radius. Um, so where there was less diversity in those tree species, um, there were more insectivores. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit complex, but essentially what I found was that insectivorous birds were associated with uh, large shrubs, uh, but in much broader regions of small trees. Um, which were largely of the same species uh, on dunes. So I then looked at um, the amount of time that these insectivores spent in different types of habitat um, on these dunes. Um, and again, found that insectivores were mostly in um, these areas where you had large shrubs and trees on the dunes. So this poses a potentially an interesting question in, in that, um, you know, why were they there? Is it possibly because there's more invertebrate prey um, in these regions? And so do these um, areas of large vegetation on dunes um, provide effectively a, a habitat or a diet refuge for these insectivorous birds during drought? And that's, that's not something I was able to test, but hopefully down the track, someone will take that further. So overall, uh, for this first study and my, which made up my honors thesis, uh, my findings suggest that the structure and distribution of avian communities in arid Australia um, during droughts are largely shaped by remaining resources and not so much by the effects of dingoes on the landscape. Um, so to conserve um, these bird communities um, during extended dry periods and droughts, um, grazing and clearing of dune vegetation should be minimized um, as, it, as these vegetation communities represent uh, potentially a drought refuge uh, for birds that are able to persist during these times. Um, generally, the relative influence of resources and dingo mediated processes on birds likely fluctuates with resource availability, both spatially and temporally. Um, and management of these ecosystems needs to account for that variation. So my second study um, was substantially smaller um, and more opportunistic than my honors thesis. So the way that um, our honours theses work now and the way they're designed is at least at UNSW, we effectively write a paper. Um, so I wasn't able to easily link this second part into my thesis. So I completed it as a separate study. Um, but just today I've been notified that this second study has been accepted to be published. So hopefully that'll come out soon. So in this bit of work, I spent a total of 39 hours sitting in my work ute, uh, watching birds drink at a small grey water overflow just out the back of the homestead at Fort Grey. Uh, the ute effectually, effectively functioned as a mobile bird hide, minimising disturbance on the birds while I was watching them. So for each survey, I sat in the ute for three hours, uh, counting every drinking visit a bird made to the water point. Surveys were completed in the morning from half an hour before first light for three hours, at midday and in the evening until half an hour after last light. Uh, this was done to ensure that pre-dawn drinking birds such as Burke's parrot weren't missed. On my first trip out to Sturt in early April, I completed five surveys 
And when I returned a month later in May, I completed a further eight surveys. Remembering that this was the driest two year period on record for the region, it was quite exciting for me at the time, um, having only seen the area um, very dry and very dead, um, that approximately 20 millimetres of rain fell at around Fort Grey in between those two trips. So importantly, that provided me with an opportunity to compare how drinking bird behaviour during drought was affected by a small resource pulse, um, like this rainfall event. So before I get into what I found, I just wanted to share a few pictures um, from the area and the birds that came in to drink. So you can see this water point. Uh, it's essentially just a small, um, a small drain um, just out the back of the homestead. And it just trickles into a, a small sort of open area that provides maybe 15 meters um, by two meters of area of water for birds to come in to drink from. So galahs visited in large flocks, uh, particularly in the afternoons, but also in the morning. Crested pigeons, um, and you can see ones pictured in there with the galahs, um, they're actually the most abundant drinking bird um, coming in in their hundreds in the mornings before rain. Um, but for me, the, the absolute highlight of doing this study was being able to spend time watching Burke's parrots. Um, so they're a small and cryptic arid parrot, um, which typically drink before or after, uh, before or at first light, and again, after sunset, presumably to avoid falcons and goshawks, which may prey on them. Um, so to watch the birds, um, Burke's parrots particularly, because not much else came in when it was still dark, um, I used an infrared camera um, so that I could pick up birds arriving and drinking um, while I couldn't actually see them. <laughs> so um, yeah, but even on days that I wasn't doing my surveys, I often spent um, my evening just sitting quietly by the water watching them when they came in to drink um, and just watch them interacting with each other, chasing each other around. And, yeah, just generally enjoying themselves. And now I'm hoping that this short video will work. There we go. So this is a, a Burke's parrot that was in drinking at this water point. They'd, they'd often chase each other around, um, like like you just saw. Um, and yeah, one one evening I had a, a total of eighteen coming in to drink, which was just yeah, it's just great to watch. So back to the science, um, before rainfall, um, I saw significantly more birds coming in to drink than afterwards. Um, when I ran my statistical model to test this difference, um, I included a measure for temperature to see if this may be affecting this pattern because April and May, um, things are starting to cool down between those periods. Um, and logically when it's cooler, birds need to drink less. Um, However, there was no statistically significant effect of temperature on bird drinking. Um, and I had a few days where temperature overlapped um, between the sampling um, periods, um, but the drinking behavior was still reduced after the rainfall event compared to before on these days. Um, of particular note is that 17 different species, which are pictured on the, the left side of the graph, um, were recorded before the rainfall event, 
uh, but only three were observed afterwards, despite more surveys being done in the evenings afterwards. So I dug into some species specific responses uh, to work out which species had reduced their drinking activity after rainfall compared to before. It's worth acknowledging that the bottom four species on this graph were only recorded once and the magpie lark and little corella only observed twice um, to drink. Such low sample sizes make it impossible to detect uh, any differences statistically, um, but raw comparisons of which species were seen before rainfall versus afterwards is still informative here. And of all the 17 species recorded, only Burke's parrot, white plumed and spiny cheeked honey eaters were recorded drinking after the rainfall. Both of these honey eaters are effectively resident in planted uh, red gums along the home, uh, just around the homestead along the road in. Um, which likely explains their drinking visits, although reduced, um, after rainfall. Burke's parrots were observed nesting uh, in the peak of the drought, um, and they therefore um, were probably somewhat restricted in their movements, um, and they were nesting very close to Fort Grey. So continued visitation, my, my, it could have been because the water point represented a local and reliable water source. Aside from Burke's parrot, um, the, ace, the eight most abundantly recorded species, and by abundantly I mean most regularly visiting to drink, um, drove the overall patterns that I observed. And of these species, the crested pigeon was by far the most abundant, um, and I was lucky, or perhaps the pigeons were unlucky, uh, to come across two dead individuals before the rainfall event which allowed me to look at the contents of their crops. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, a crop is a, a small pouch uh, in the esophagus of birds where they're effectively able to store food. Um, so by looking at the crop contents, I could work out um, what they'd been eating. So while it was a little smelly, um, it was very informative um, as I was able to determine that these birds were exclusively eating seeds from the soil seed bank during this period, as the plants that the seeds were from were not fruiting or seeding at the time, uh, which wasn't surprising given the drought. So this raises an interesting question. Um, as anecdotally, I only came across the birds within 15 to 20 kilometers of the water point. Um, and this water point represented the only water for roughly a 30 kilometer radius. Um, could the rate of uptake of seeds um, by crested pigeons um, be increased within this radius of the water point uh, compared to further away? Um, so I had no means to test this, but if true, it would have some quite interesting implications for the plants um, distributed around the water point. Um, if their seeds are being eaten more around water points during drought, um, than not during drought, um, but also compared to areas further away from these water points where crested pigeons aren't able to forage in because it's too far from the water. So we weren't able to test this, um, but something interesting to think about. Finally, I looked at how bird drinking uh, changed with time of day. Uh, per survey period, birds visited the water point to drink significantly less after rainfall than before. So in the mornings, there were substantially less uh, birds drinking uh, after the rainfall than before and so on. Uh, quite interestingly though, I found a strong pattern both before and after rainfall of birds prefer preferentially drinking uh, in the mornings and evenings rather than in the middle of the day. So regardless of water availability in the landscape, when birds came in to drink, they preferred to drink early or late rather than in the middle of the day, uh, potentially because during the warmer parts of the day, raptors might be more active as they're able to use thermals to cover ground. So overall in this second study, there were two key broad findings. Um, I found that the birds out in Sturt would readily exploit uh, resource pulses. Um, when they occurred, even during drought. 
uh, as they likely dispersed across the landscape. Um, and this is probably quite likely to be true uh, more broadly across a lot of arid habitats. Um, and secondly, permanent water in these environments um, definitely provides a refuge during drought for these species and may concentrate feeding activity with uh, unknown consequences as yet um, on whatever they're feeding on. However, it is worth acknowledging that permanent water in these landscapes also supports large grazing mammals, uh, which can degrade habitat and feral cats and foxes, which are incredibly detrimental to native species, including birds. Uh, so permanent water points can sustain native bird life during drought, but this doesn't mean that they are necessarily a, a good thing to keep in the environment. Uh, it's just an observation of the effects that they, they have on native birds. And that uh, just about wraps up my talk. Um, and yeah, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you at um, yeah, the Oatley Flora and Fauna Conservation Society um, for supporting this work, um, enabling me to complete my research and just generally to spend time, um, a total of three months out in the desert during my honours year. So yeah, thank you. That's fantastic, Simon. It's really meticulous and detailed, isn't it? Takes a lot of work. Um, are you happy to take questions? Absolutely. Um, would you like me to stop sharing the screen or are you? Uh, no, that's fine. You can yep. leave it Leave it up. Uh, you might want to go back to a slide or something, I suppose. Yep. Um, so you can leave it there. Um, I'll put up the chat. Has anybody got any questions out there? Um, there's none put into the chat yet at this stage. I'd like to ask some questions, Kim. Deb. Okay, Deb, I was waiting for you to, to uh, opt in. Okay, go ahead. Deb, Andrew, Simon, thanks very much for a great presentation and a very impressive study. Uh, a couple of questions. Given you have did the study during the drought, uh, you didn't detect differences across the fence. Do you feel that the drought itself did the job of the dingo? on the New South Wales side and effectively reduce the macropod population down. And uh, my second question I've made just um, in regard to your second part of the study, while uh, people acknowledge that the uh, artificial watering points encourage additional high levels of macropods and possibly, you know, feral animals like goats and pigs, do you think there's an argument given climate change and increasing aridity of our landscapes um, that we should still look at maintaining some artificial watering points to maintain bird diversity in the landscape if we can then uh, segregate it away from some of those feral animals? Um, I'll, I'll start on your second question. Um, I think that artificial water points are yeah, they're, they're pretty bad for the environment generally in arid areas. Um, as you said, they enable a lot of um, feral and also just large grazing mammals like kangaroos um, to really proliferate, um, but also to survive during drought and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of damage that's done. In terms of maintaining them um, with exclusion, um, of those species, um, it could work. Uh, I don't. I don't really have a, a strong answer for that. Um, it's definitely an interesting idea. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the way that Sturt's currently being managed, and a lot of um, arid conservation work, uh, areas are being managed, is um, it's all slowly moving towards uh, removing those artificial water points. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, I guess, my answer to the second question. The first question, uh, definitely there was a huge drop in macropod um, abundances um, in Sturt during the drought. Um, I didn't see it before, um, but my supervisors, Beck and Reese, did. Um, they had kangaroos basically just in their backyard, which was the only place that had any water 
um, trying desperately to to get some water and just dying all around the place. So it was pretty horrific uh, mm -hmm. when the drought hit and when they started dying off. Um, and yeah, there were I saw very few kangaroos when I was out there. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely think that the drought um, did a, a serious number on on kangaroos on probably on both sides of the fence. It was that severe. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, here's a question from Roger. Are dingo populations the same in drought and wet on the South Australian side? Uh, I don't know. Um, probably not would be my guess. I would assume that like most things, um, particularly during this drought, that uh, dingo numbers would have reduced. Um, so that's, that's another factor um, that could have led to the lack of difference um, across the fence. But that being said, um, we didn't survey them uh, specifically, um, didn't have time to do nocturnal surveys, sadly. Um, but yeah, we did find that there were still dingoes on the South Australian side and we observed them uh, probably uncommonly as opposed to twice ever in New South Wales. And then they got baited. I think three tons of baits got dropped while we were doing surveys to clear them out of the national park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, okay, here's another one um, from Kit. Uh, did you see many feral cats or foxes on either side of the fence? I didn't see any. I saw tracks of cats in, on both sides. Um, and just before I got there, a feral cat had gotten into the chicken coop at Fort Grey um, and, yeah, killed a chook. Um, I can't remember if I saw fox tracks, but if I did, it would have been in South Australia. Um, but, yeah, very, very few. Um, and I mentioned the, the Wild Deserts Project, um, which involves exclusion fences. Um, so they put the fences up um, and then they had to get all the roos and the ferals, including rabbits, uh, out of those exclusion areas. Um, and that job usually takes ages, but because the drought hit everything in, in those exclusion fences, there were gates, basically one-way gates for things to get out. Um, and they also used a, a dog to sniff out the rabbits and cats and that sort of thing. Um, but they dis the ferals disappeared so quickly um, because of the drought. Um, so yeah, really low numbers of feral species out there. Okay. Um, from Leslie, uh, what was your most surprising discovery from your study? Well, I wasn't expecting um, to find no difference. Uh, in hindsight, it's, um, it's quite logical that, that there would be no difference across the fence. Um, but I was sure that we would still find a difference. And, you know, when we were doing surveys, it became more and more apparent that there wasn't, it did, there didn't appear to be too much of a difference. But that being said, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that was probably the most, most surprising thing. Um, and then, yeah, just, just fluking a few, a few random critters that were quite rare and that sort of thing was also very exciting um, and surprising. Um, again, given the drought, I just didn't think <coughs> many rare things around. Um, but yeah, there are a few here and there. Mm. Interesting. Okay, the next one's from Janine. Uh, what is the area of the exclusion zone? How long has the uni been managing these uh, uh, zones? Um, so I think Richard Kingsford is going to do a talk uh, later this year. I heard uh, mentioned just before this um, I started. Yep, yep. in um, September, I think. Yeah, so he'll provide you with a lot more detail than I can off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe that Beck and Reese moved in to Fort Grey around 2016, 2017, um, and have been working on the project ever since. 
the area of the exclusions. It's it's quite a complicated design, but essentially you've got two um, diamond shaped exclosures, uh, one north of the other. Um, and those are four by five kilometers each. Um, and the, the tips, the southern tip of the northern and the northern tip of the southern uh, diamond are connected by a fence. And then the other ends of the, the diamonds are connected to the dingo fence to essentially create um, a, what they call a wild training area. So within those diamonds, um, the native mammals will breed up but they're able to get out, nothing can get in, but they're able to get out when their populations reach uh, effectively saturation for the area. Um, and they can move out into those, uh, that wild training area. And in that area, um, they are um, trapping and um, baiting and that sort of thing for, for ferals. Um, but there are still some around as opposed to none. And I think the, the overall goal is to to look at if um, evolution can be effectively sped up um, by teaching these animals to deal with ferals um, through a uh, kind of soft release. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, from uh, Kit. Do you know if UNSW is still using Fowler's Gap Research Station? In a former life, I used to go there with Sydney Uni. Uh, yes, they definitely are. And it's being changed from uh, a sheep station, which it currently is, uh, to a conservation managed station. So they're completely destocking it um, and working um, towards effectively making it a, a proper sort of a private but um, conservation reserve managed by UNSW um, on which, yeah, people like me could potentially go out there and, and do, do research. Um, I'm actually hoping to start um, with some help, um, some bird surveys and potentially some bird banding out there um, to, yeah, start to look at um, how that change, the destocking is going to, affect the bird communities. Okay. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question directly of Simon, that's probably um, be more pleasant for everybody than hearing me read them out. Nobody? There's no more on the chat line at this stage. Okay, I might um, just ask you, in terms of um, working out what management processes would be best adopted, and you suggested that um, don't overgraze the tops of dunes, um, would that, that would have to apply to land outside the national park and uh, in other places, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, they wouldn't have grazing in the national park. Um, but that, I presume you would try to get that message out um, as far and as wide as possible. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. Um, within the national park, there is still the issue of, of kangaroos in, uh, in an overabundance. Um, which are effectively grazers. So there's, I guess the the idea is to to reduce grazing on on dune tops. Um, but how you go about that isn't just um, managing um, cattle or excluding cattle, which isn't really possible in in a um, big pastoral station like Lindon or Bollards, on which I worked out there. Um, it's more about I guess just not overstocking and and resulting in overgrazing, because um, that's logically the only way that that sort of thing can be managed out there. Mm. Just because it's a, on such a big scale, uh, it's not possible to do exclusions, and that would have all sorts of issues as well. So yeah. Mm. Okay. A any more? One last question out there. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that's been fantastic, uh, Simon. Most illuminating. It's uh, very meticulous work you've been doing out there for such a long time. Um, I'm sure we've all appreciated it. I'd like to call on um, uh, Graham Fry to uh, uh, move a vote of thanks uh, to you on behalf of Oatley Flora and Fauna. Thank you, Simon. That was an um, extremely interesting uh, talk you gave. I often recall when we met many years ago when you were still a school student and you come up to Monkhorn Gap for a weekend and and how enthusiastic you, you were about birds then. And it's, it's really great to see you continuing on with your with your um, keen, keenness of studying the AB fauna. And, and we can do it with more people like you, particularly in the, in the universities these days. And it's, it's really wonderful to see these really important studies being carried out. And, uh, and, and I think Oatley Four and Fauna members were really gratified to think that little bit of money that people donate in my organisation goes on to help studies like you're carried out and 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 really and covering some really important information and it makes us feel very good and uh, and, and it's, it's probably better for us to think that people are actually using the money to do real research rather than just writing endless letters and to politicians who totally ignore us most of the time so so thank you Simon it's been a, a really uh, really interesting talk and. and it's great to see how you've gone on from being an enthusiastic school student to a, to a fully, fully uh, professional uh, researcher. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Graham. It's very kind. Thanks, Simon. That's been terrific. Um, we're going to move into our general business section of the meeting. You're welcome to stay and, and listen, um, uh, hear about the, some of the things that we're doing here, or um, uh, you're free to um, log off and um, I can go and have something to eat or something or something to drink. Maybe. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm keen to listen. Okay, great. Yeah, good to have you around. Okay. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that uh, most of our talks this year are on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just scroll down to and click on the button on the website homepage and you get, you, know, you should get to it. So uh, we've got, um, as I said, pretty well all the um, talks this year, the presentations this year on our YouTube channel. So go there and refresh your memories on what we've heard. Um, and you can subscribe and uh, you won't miss out on future videos. You'll be notified. Okay, moving into uh, general business. Um, the uh, on campaigns um, and uh, the first one is an update on the Glen Lee um, area in Lugano. Um, as we've uh, indicated, developers lodged an application to subdivide the estate into 31 lots, demolish buildings, remove trees and build roads. The farms an immense social, cultural, historical and ecological value. Um, a lot of this uh, material that I'm just reading here is um, is in the newsletter. Um, uh, there was a meeting um, a couple of weeks ago now uh, on site. Uh, Mayor Kevin Green and Colin Symington attended. There were probably over 100 people there um, on and off um, throughout the, an hour or so. And um, they heard, they were expressing their views on uh, trying to keep the property uh, and keep it uh, open for the public. And um, that was impressed on the council. They went away with um, lots of information to write submissions. Uh, so I imagine uh, there's lots of submissions being put in. Um, now, that was the period of exhibition of this uh, development application supposedly ended on the 16th of November, but of uh, June, sorry. Uh, but I understand in legal terms, the council must consider all submissions received right up until uh, the, um, uh, the approving authority um, is about to consider it. And in this case, that will be the 
local planning panel unless the developer um, skids it straight through to the Land and Environment Court. So um, if you haven't written a submission, uh, it's not too late uh, to write one and send it to uh, George River Council. Uh, and 